First of all, good morning, everybody, and thank you very much for joining this Rethink Trade conversation about why progressives must reclaim the trade agenda from Trump. The political case is very obvious, and we have Congressman Dingell to tell us the story from Michigan, but Trump was elected by flipping Midwestern states with appeals to working class voters on trade. And after decades of corporate rigged trade policies, the pain is very real. Almost 3 million jobs have been certified as the loss to trade by the US government. And that's just under a program that misses probably most of the jobs. <laughs> From large cities like Detroit, Milwaukee, Cleveland, Gary, to smaller cities and towns across the country, there's been real devastation to people's lives and livelihoods. And people know the story of manufacturing but as we're gonna hear from Brenda Roberts, who's a vice president of the Communication Workers of America, there's also been mass outsourcing of union service sector jobs. The service sector jobs that actually have benefits and have a union protecting and representing and fighting for workers, like call centers of our banks and airlines have been mass outsourced. So the political situation is people are hurting and as a result, they were open to appeals and saw the Democrats as not having the right position. But the policy case is just as strong. And in part, Congressman Khan is gonna talk about that. And we're also gonna hear from Alex Lawson from Social Security Works about that. Because the aspirations, the policy aspirations of progressives rely on replacing our old trade policies. Be it for climate justice, for racial justice, for economic equality, for access to affordable medicines. These so-called trade agreements, have provisions in them because they are corporate rigged, negotiated behind closed doors with hundreds of corporate advisors that, for instance, there are provisions in the WTO that would make a single payer healthcare system ostensibly a violation of the WTO. What? Our trade agreements have rules on energy that would undermine some of the key changes we need for climate. Trade agreements have investor rights that actually promote job outsourcing and a race to the bottom away from good union jobs to low wage jobs. So these kind of rules, including the limits on financial regulation and the, the limits on monopoly breakups and all of these agreements are things that on the policy front, we simply as progressives have to grab and change because Trump's agenda doesn't fix that. He did some changes that are longstanding democratic changes, but a lot of his agreements are packed with new rights for big tech to limit our privacy, to increase their monopolies. His agreements were packed with big pharma, new giveaways until Congresswoman Dingell and Congressman Khanna and their democratic colleagues forced the change. So we, as progressives have both our political and policy goals dependent on getting trade right. But at the same time, many people are confounded by Trump's faux populism. And so progressives have run away from trade. They're afraid that they're gonna sound like Trump, but our agenda is different and the political imperative is really real to change the agreements to help who are hurting and to be able to promote all of our future goal to deal with the many crises that are facing us and also to to beat trump in 2020 and realign the democratic party with the voters it should represent progressives must understand how to contrast both trump trade and the failed status quo of neoliberalism with real progressive alternatives that put people on the planet first. So with that to introduce our panel, we are extremely fortunate to have four speakers who are both kick-ass progressives, activists, go-getters, but also have played an important role in this debate and have lived experience in how to communicate, even in this peculiar Trump era, to make clear the difference in our agenda and why we have to get this right. So we're going to start with Congressman Ro Khanna. He's going to do a broad overview of the conflicts with our goals and this agenda. Congressman Khanna is um, obviously the congressman who represents California's 17th district. That's in Northern California since 2017. He has had a wide set of experience in politics, 
as a working administration, as a professor, he is also a lawyer, and we're incredibly honored and excited to have a great progressive leader who many people also knew as a co-chair of Bernie Sanders' presidential campaign. Thank you so much for joining us, Congressman Khanna. Um, it's my honor to turn the mic over to Congressman Ro Khanna. Well, thank you, Lori, and thank you for your uh, incredible leadership uh, in helping so many uh, House Democrats really stand up for workers' rights and uh, make uh, uh, the revisions that were necessary uh, on NAFTA. And I'm uh, honored to be here with all the panelists, but especially uh, Debbie Dingell, who's been a, a mentor to me and to uh, so many uh, of us on, on these issues and really speaks from firsthand experience. I thought I would just set the uh, economic mistake that I think has uh, driven so much uh, of uh, our consensus over the last 30 years. And there was this view that uh, trade would uh, benefit uh, the, the country uh, and uh, people who were left out would somehow uh, do fine, that we would be able to uh, ask them uh, to get new jobs or get retrained or uh, move somewhere and everything would work out. And that just was a total mistake. I mean, economists uh, missed the reality, which is that when manufacturing uh, left certain communities and certain towns and went either overseas or uh, was automated, uh, that those towns were devastated, that those people uh, often went uh, on disability. They did not see new jobs come to those communities. It had an impact beyond just manufacturing because manufacturing had a multiplier effect. So uh, people who didn't have those jobs now were unable to support all of the businesses uh, that were in a community. Uh, and Deaton and Case have written this incredible book, uh, Debts of Despair, where they actually document how the decline of manufacturing in these communities uh, led to shortened life expectancy, uh, largely for the white working class, higher disabilities, uh, it was part of the cause uh, uh, and the conditions for the opioid crisis. And all while this was taking place, we had policymakers saying, trade everyone wins, we can just redistribute. Uh, with not understanding that a, a job and the dignity of work is so much more than any handout. People didn't want a handout, they wanted the dignity and pride uh, of working. And they didn't want to go move to Silicon Valley, where I am from. No one wanted to be said and say, okay, go move to New York and go move to Silicon Valley. Just as it would be unfair to ask people in Silicon Valley or New York to say, go move to Debbie Dingell's district. People are rooted in a community. They have family there. They've had generations there. And we were basically saying, okay, either you move uh, or uh, you get a handout, but these, we're not going to do anything uh, to create jobs. And that was, I think, the fundamental flaw. And of course, look, there are benefits of trade, but we exaggerated those benefits. The reality is, I mean, the United States depends on certain parts of trade and global supply chains, but as a huge economy, we are probably less dependent uh, on trade than we, uh, we, than we say we are. And these trade agreements uh, were, became almost the, uh, a mantra that somehow the economy depended on that uh, with little concern for these communities. So uh, what then should the policy that were hard? You needed to make sure that worker standards uh, were upheld. Ration a rate uh, with no for uh, worker dignity. I mean that uh, a total abandonment, I would say, uh, of uh, communities. And the interesting part is that, uh, unfortunately, I think Democrats didn't do that. We kept having these ideas that people would get retrained. I mean, I couldn't get, I'm, I'm 43. And if you ask me, Ro, go get retrained to do manufacturing, I'd say, my, my wife would tell you, are you kidding? I mean, I have enough trouble just putting a shed together outside. You think that somehow I, at 43, I'm going to go get retrained to have a manufacturing job? And yet we were telling people at 55 or 60, go get retrained and uh, go do something else. That was a, a, an absurd expectation. So what then is the Democratic vision? And I, of course, want to hear uh, Debbie Dingell. It's not, I don't think, just to have uh, tariffs, because that in some ways may end up 
hurting uh, our agricultural communities, our farmers, in the way that manufacturing was hurt. I mean, we start having uh, huge tariffs and a trade war. Uh, that means that our, our, our uh, farmers, our agricultural communities will be as hard hit probably uh, as uh, some of the manufacturing communities were. But what it, is, what it does mean is that we need to make sure that we don't have multinationals driving trade agreements, that we protect worker rights, that we protect the right to unionize, that we make sure that there is a, uh, a wage uh, standard uh, so that these jobs just aren't uh, offshore because of wages. And I believe we need a massive infusion of industrial policy where these communities that have been hard hit, that have seen manufacturing leave, uh, we need to have the federal government come in and provide massive funding uh, for the creation of jobs and, and, and frankly, to incentivize companies to, to keep uh, employed uh, older workers uh, uh, who, who want to work, who want a job, and who it's unfair to expect to, to uh, have to relearn something at a later age. So I think we need a national industrial policy, and I think we need worker equity in any trade agreement. Uh, and that is a way forward that the Democrats can articulate. Thank you very much, Congressman. And Kana, if we consider the main challenges facing us, the current rules of the global economy written by and for big corporations basically constrain governments from taking the right actions that you're describing like industrial policy by labeling them as trade barriers or foreign investor constraints and instead incentivize exactly the wrong conduct such as corporate concentration and outsourcing. So so we are now going to hear from Congress, and that's why we have to replace the rules. We're going to hear from Congresswoman Debbie Dingell, who obviously coming from Michigan has had the experience of the manufacturing sector outsourcing, and as well has been very focused on what's been happening during the COVID crisis of us all now living with the results, not just the manufacturing worker who lost his or her job, but all of us who can't get the essential goods that we need because we can't make them here anymore, exposing our health security, our national security, while a lot of big corporations have outsourced production and uh, merged and merged and merged until they're just a few producers. So it's my honor to introduce Congresswoman Debbie Dingell. She's one of Congress's leading champions for working people. She makes sure everyone paying attention to what really is happening to working people. We can all get um, into a bubble in Washington, D.C., and Congressman Dingell is one of those people who comes with a sword in favor of working people and bubble bubbles to make sure people understand what it's really like. She represents Michigan's 12th congressional district since 2015 and has been a relentless champion for workers' rights, for higher wages, for fair trade, for access to affordable medicines. It's my honor to introduce Congresswoman Evie Dingell. Thank you, Lori, for that uh, very kind introduction. And I want to thank Lori and Public Citizens for the work that they are doing every day protecting workers. And what an honor it is to be on with Roe who is, uh, Ro and I just do a lot together. He uh, understands and fights for people every single day. And you as uh, just everyday working men and women need to know Ro's always got your back. And then when you talk about social security works, today's the 85th anniversary of the signing of the social security act. And we, we're not talking about that today, but I do want to tell people that we do have someone who's trying to destroy the program and we can't let that happen. And Brenda is just one of those incredible women labor leaders that I love working with. So I'm excited just to be on the panel this morning with everybody. And I'm actually gonna, before I go to the more scripted remarks, I wanna really build on what Roe said. He really did define what has happened in this country and the reality, and it's not, it's happened. My district's a very complicated district. Quite frankly, it's one of the most diverse in the country. And I like living in a diverse district. I have Ann Arbor, which uh, thinks of itself as another Silicon Valley. And it does have great uh, tech uh, engineers and a lot of good work is doing there. Uh, but I have what I lovingly call home, the Down Rivers, 
which is where a lot of auto plants were. It's the home of the auto industry. Dearborn, where I live, is where the first factory was built in this country. And they're working men and women who just really care about this country. And they've watched their jobs be eliminated year after year. And people think, oh, well, it's equalized out. It hasn't. Even right before COVID started, one of the steel plants put people on layoff. And while they haven't publicly announced it, we know they're going to shut it right after the election. They're being political right now and don't want people to talk about what's really happening. And I have another steel plant who's had put people on layoff and permanently eliminated another 200 jobs. A, a, a Solucia, another company in my district, I'm like Miss Depressing. And COVID didn't in, impact them either. They closed last week. So this is a reality for me and my district and the working men and women that I represent every single day. And we have to understand, yes, we are competing in a global marketplace, but we do not compete on a level playing field. The trade deals that we have cut in the last decades give all, give all kinds of advantages to other countries. Currency is manipulated, as, as Lori talked about, environmental laws aren't the same, wages aren't the same, it, it, there are just very real and significant issues, which we are now seeing played out. We talk about them. People whose jobs have been eliminated know how they've been screwed in these communities. Oh, now I'm supposed to talk nicer uh, uh, in these communities, but they have. But now COVID has really shined a light on what the fractures are. Um, in this fight against folk team, we've seen the desperate need for medical supplies. So the people on the front line, not just thank you, the nurses and the doctors, in the, in the janitors in the hospitals, but the bus drivers and the grocery store workers and the glue of our civilized society, which is on an off topic in this country, we don't even think are worth paying $15 an hour. Maybe we need to reevaluate the worth of what jobs we have. But they are, we're trying to just make sure they have PPE equipment and we couldn't get it in this country. It's not produced here. And we had to go to China and get sub quality equipment as it was being brought in. It's just highlighted the shortcomings in our US trade policy. Our trade agreements have incentivized companies to move manufacturing offshore for years. And that's making it extremely difficult for the state and federal governments to procure the supplies that we've needed in order to address this pandemic. And I'm also gonna point out to you, I, I don't know what the exact figure is, but it's an un acceptable figure how much of our medicine that we need in this United States is produced overseas. Is it, you know, some people believe it's 80% is produced in China. That should make anybody be afraid. 90% of our antibiotics. We can't be dependent on another foreign country like this. NAFTA 2.0, uh, that's my language for it, but the new NAFTA that we passed got rid of some of the problematic policies and put in place for an industry like the auto industry, tighter rules of origin. We fought for, and I wanna make it really clear to everybody listening, it was Democrats who fought for this. It was not the president of the United States. I, and I still wonder if I should have voted for this bill or not, but the first NAFTA was so bad and was hurting my workers every single day. We had to do something to bring about change. And we would not vote for a new bill until we got significant changes in there. So we made some solid and tangible improvements in the trade regime with the new NAFTA, but we're not done. And we're gonna keep fighting until we see those changes made. But what we still need is a framework that has strong and enforceable wage standards so that the American worker doesn't have to compete for a job with countries that play extremely low wages. And I'll tell you, my district's an example. I have a plant that is identical in floor plan in Trenton, Michigan, that if you go to Mexico, and in Mexico, they pay $3 an hour. You tell me how we can compete in this country with people are, that are paying those low wages, which is what we are trying to do. We need to level the playing field for the American worker because they've got to compete at a fair rate. These are the types of changes we've got to make to our trade regime. 
We're already seeing the negative effects of this hyper-globalization and types of public health and national security concerns that have been brought with them. But it's not just our trade policies that have caused this shortage and time crunch. It's a result of years of overall policy failing. It's a result of a tax system and structure incentivizing offshoring. And by that way, that bill that gave all the billionaires their tax cut, it also continued to incentivize corporations to locate overseas. This has got to be a wake up call for those in government to see the need to rein those incentives in. Because having that thriving manufacturing base here at home allows us to have flexibility and resiliency to respond to a crisis like this with speed and effectiveness. Look at a country like Germany. They have industrial training and apprenticeship programs through their government. They have a program to create innovation clusters which promotes domestic and international growth. We need domestic policies that support that kind of growth here in America. We need to not just fix our trade policies, but our tax code to promote, not penalize companies that stay here in the United States of America. They're our heroes, let's call them the heroes for creating jobs here and giving people a decent wage and benefits. And when we talk about needing ventilators and PPE, right now those things are being primarily manufactured in China. Now I'm really proud of the fact that when we had a crisis that, but it wasn't a crisis that got handled right as an editorial comment. We had many auto manufacturers who stepped up to the plate and converted plants to make money, many of these things as, as much as possible. Not only did they make ventilators, and I'm very proud of the fact that the Rosie the Riveter plant located in my district converted just like they did in World War II. The UAW workers, Brenda, you know, were great to make those um, ventilators. But we've got to, we've got to make sure that we're doing this. We can do this under normal circumstances. Um, uh, we, but we need things not, we're right now, we're working like we're responding to, we're responding to yesterday. We need to be here in the moment and be ready for the future. Under normal circumstances, it takes a while to get things here from China. But having to sail across an ocean, be processed at a port, loaded on trucks and shipped across the country has endangered our frontline workers. And it's not a luxury we've had right now, and we don't have the time. But the more time we take to put these things into the hands of those that need them, the, worse, the more time we take, the worse it is on those that need them and have the virus. So when we think of how we're gonna prepare for what comes next, having a thriving manufacturing base here in the US will help us respond to the speed necessary to curb this type of pandemic earlier and save thousands of lives. But there's good news in all of this. Our companies and our workers, and it's our workers, I want to make that point, it's our workers that were scared of COVID but went into the plants, they learned the new, and they're there making sure we had to do what we had to do. They're showing innovative ways of responding to the rapidly challenged needs. Auto manufacturers retooled their production to make ventilators and PPE and face masks overnight. It's something we haven't done in this country since World War II. And that trend is likely to continue as we ramp up our efforts to combat this crisis. But we're gonna need everyone, all hands on deck to come out and reduce the loss of lives. So that's why I'm so adamant that people listen to their governors, their mayors and their public health officials when they say, wear your masks, practice physical distance. Those are buying things. But the truth of the matter is we need to address these problems. They're accumulated over decades of failed trade and tax policies that have hurt the American worker and have let us flat footed in the response to the pandemic. So the pandemic has shined a light about how we need to move our supply chains back home. But let me tell you something, the auto industry, we went through a lot of crisis when we shut down and we went through a lot of crisis when we reopened. And our supply chain is dependent on Mexico, not here made in America. We need to bring that supply chain home too. 
something I've worked on a long time as a member of Congress. And it's still, as I talked to you about at the beginning of this, you're still seeing the impact on my district. We've seen too many factories closed, jobs disappeared, and workers are tired of it. They want to know that somebody cares about them here. And you know, the other thing I want to say to you as I close, this is a national security issue. If we have some kind of, if we have a next pandemic, which we could, do we want the medicine we need to take made here so we can get it or made a world away where that country may be our enemy and they cut us off from medicine? Do we want to be producing generators for our grid where things can even be done to them and have to depend on them? Or do we want to be responsible for our own electricity grid? And I only want to drive a car made here in America. So I thank you all for being here today and talking about us. We can't keep going in the wrong direction. It is time. This pandemic should be, given, be the catalyst to make us turn our direction around and go in the right direction. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Congresswoman Dingle. And I thank folks for all horrors of this pandemic. The Congresswoman is spot on right that it has actually woken a lot of people to how gutted out our production capacity has become. I think a lot of people were surprised and had this personal experience. Without being grim about it, I want to flag that our worker champions, Congressman Connor and Congressman Dingle, are not the average as far as paying attention to these issues and fighting so fiercely for the change. So as progressives, part of what we need to do is educate members of Congress, all of them, though increasingly, I would say Democratic members of Congress have become increasingly aware because of the hard work of of the members here and Congressman Rosa DeLauro and, and others. But there is a big fight because these hyper globalization rules didn't come down from God. They're not somehow the default. They're specific rules written for specific interests. It's corporate rigged and it was not by accident. So we now have lots of ceilings that forbid the regulations and policies we need. And we have no floors of human decency for labor rights and human rights. And we're going to have to replace that. As the Congresswoman said, NAFTA is not the model. It was a step in the right direction. But we also have to make the changes, as Congressman Khanna said, in industrial policy. We need the changes in tax policy. We need to have some direct breaking up of monopolies. And finally, we need to make sure that we have direct rules against outsourcing. And that is the perfect transition to Brenda Roberts, who is the Vice President of District 7 of the Communication Workers of America. The CWA has had a huge impact on fighting for jobs of call center workers who are being mass outsourced like manufacturing workers and have legislation um, to try and stop that. She has been on the executive board of CWA since 2015, and she is the board chair of the Cu Customer Service Committee. Um, that is the that is the committee represent that is the committee that focuses on call center work. She represents many service sector workers, call centers across the country, and the committee focuses on securing legislation that supports call center workers, health and safety issues, and improving the environment in call centers. As part of her duties, Brenda's traveled to call centers in the U.S., but also to places where U.S. union represented high-wage good benefit call centers have been outsourced to the Philippines, to Malaysia, to build international solidarity amongst call center workers, because in those other countries, the same rights and benefits and wages that CWA has fought so hard for for the U.S. workers obviously are not being granted to the workers whose jobs are the outsourced, the workers who are doing the outsourced jobs. So it's my honor to introduce CWA Vice President Brenda Roberts. Moot, moot. There we go. Sorry there about we go. that. Thank you, Lori, for that introduction. Good morning, sisters and brothers. It's so great to be with you in the Net Roots Nation. Uh, I am so honored to be on a panel with Representative Kana and Representative Dingle and Alex from Social Security. Uh, Representative Kana and Representative Dingle have been amazing champions for labor and our issues, and we know we can always count on them to do what's right 
not for the big corporations, but for the working class uh, and for labor unions. So it's, it's great to be here. As Lori said, I'm Brenda Roberts and I'm a vice president with the Communications Workers of America. We are a labor union representing more than 700,000 members. As you just heard from Representative Khanna and Representative Dingle, the past few decades of trade agreements have been written by and for mega corporations. They do not do anything to support the worker or the consumer and they have been a failure for them. While the Trump administration claims to be fixing the broken model, they fail to deal with the core problem that have hurt us for so long. Let me tell you a little bit about how CWA members have faced this problem. CWA members work in a number of different sectors, but our biggest membership is in telecommunications. Many people don't think about service sector jobs when they think about trade, but I can personally tell you that this is a growing issue that's going to impact all of our lives in more and more ways. The trade deals that have hollowed out our manufacturing workforce have increasingly incorporated a, a language about service sector industry jobs. The workers on the front lines are being impacted by trade agreements because they make it easier for companies to move call centers overseas. Where do companies usually move these jobs? Huh. They move them to the countries where they can most easily exploit workers and dodge the rules on data security and privacy. That's bad news for our members who are losing their jobs and bad news for consumers who data, whose data becomes all the more vulnerable. But it's not just AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile that have been doing this. We see the same thing among banks, airlines, insurance companies, and all kinds of different industries. So if we don't get the trade model right, more and more jobs will be at risk and corporate giants will have all the more control over our data and lives without us having any real say in the matter. We can take a different approach to trade that would work better for those of us in the service sector and for our brothers and sisters in manufacturing. That approach is about building international power for workers. I wanna tell you about a pretty remarkable relationship that CWA has built with BN, the Filipino Call Center Workers Union. Back in 2016, CWA went on strike for a fair contract to Verizon. Not surprisingly, Verizon attempted to move much of our struck work to the Philippines. There, workers pay, are paid less than $2 an hour, less than $2 an hour, and their rights are greatly restricted by anti-labor companies, poor labor laws, and the oppressive Duterte regime. But the BN workers had our back. They refused to handle the struck work and they refused to help Verizon in breaking our strike. I can't tell you how powerful that was that these workers facing the worst conditions imaginable would stand up for us in that way. Last year, I went with a delegation of my CWA sisters and brothers to the Philippines to meet with Bien workers, one of the best experiences of my life. While we were there, we helped with their efforts to try and pass a call center workers bill of rights. BN members continue to fight for the respect and dignity they deserve, even as the Duterte regime has come up with more ways to deny workers their rights. This group is so inspiring. It reminds me of the early days of the labor movement in the United States. We're facing obstacle after obstacle. They didn't give up, they continue to fight and they're still doing that today. Since we've come back from that experience, we've redoubled our efforts to call attention to abuses by the regime and companies like Alorica that manage overseas call centers for companies like AT&T, Verizon, and Citibank. Here's the thing. We know exactly what corporations like AT&T are doing when they move our work to the Philippines. They're trying to pit us against our fellow workers overseas and as Congressman Khan has said, they're trying to create a race to the bottom and that will result in lower wages and work poorer working conditions for us. That's not fair to US workers and it's not fair to workers in other countries. But as CWA's relationship shows with BN, we can fight back. 
the old model of trade that protects the rights of corporations to move U.S. jobs overseas undermines our efforts. We need to build a model for trade agreements that protect our rights to work with our fellow workers overseas and to establish a right to collective bargaining across borders. And we can do the same type of cross-border agreements in other areas too. Our trade deals should make it easier for us to work together to fight back against climate change, to lower drug prices, and to crack down on corporate tax dodging. So let's utilize our collective power and work together to shape a trade agenda that works for working people. Once again, thank you so much for inviting me here. It's great to be with my brothers and sisters. Thank you. Brenda, thank you so much. Brenda Roberts, Vice President of CWA, an inspiring leader of labor folks, not just here, but internationally. And Brenda mentioned how the trade agreements can undermine access to affordable medicines. Our last and final speaker is Alex Lawson, who is the Executive Director of Social Security Works. That's the convening member of the Strengthening Social Security Coalition, a ginormous coalition fighting to preserve Social Security. He's also a fierce champion for access to affordable medicines and played a leadership role in the fights in the Trans-Pacific Partnership, and Fast Track, and the NAFTA replacement to make sure that when Donald Trump, during the NAFTA replacement, put new giveaways for Big Pharma into the new NAFTA, he joined incredible leadership from Congress, people like Congressman, Congresswoman Dingell to get that garbage out and made that the price of that agreement going anywhere. So before we move to Alex, I just want to remind folks, if you want to ask a question, join the conversation, please go into the Q&A box. And if you type in a question, I will read your question and get the discussion going so that your voice is part of the discussion. Please enter into the Q&A box any comments, questions. And without further ado, it's my honor to introduce Alex Lawson, the Executive Director of Social Security Works. Alex. Lori, thank you so much uh, for convening this panel. Uh, and I will continue with the, <clears throat> it's a real honor to be here with such fierce uh, champions of working people. Congresswoman Debbie Dingell uh, and Congressman Ro Khanna are two of our fiercest lions fighting uh, for working people every day. Uh, and it's important because I'm going to try to end on an up note, but I want to tell you a little bit about why sort of my job on, on new NAFTA was the easiest because I was fighting against uh, pharma. And it was easiest because it, it's an easy thing to explain. They literally write the rules. The pharmaceutical corporations write the rules on these trade deals going back for decades. And those rules that they write are specifically aimed at protecting a industry that has one business model. We, the taxpayers, pay for the research, pay for much of the development of the drugs. It's our money. We got about $10 billion going out the door right now directly into these pharmaceutical corporations' coffers uh, around COVID. These corporations have systematically dismantled their facilities in the United States of America, just systematically, and they've put them overseas, even though it's the rules in the US that allow them to charge whatever prices they want. So they take our research and development, then we hand them a patent that grants them a, mon a monopoly, which means they can spend they can charge whatever they want for uh, drugs that we pay to develop. And then we've even prevented the US government from being able to negotiate that price down. We're the only country in the world that does that. So we pay to develop the drugs, then we pay the highest prices in the world, but still that isn't enough for the corporations because they dismantle the manufacturing capabilities here in America. Uh, and they put them elsewhere, which we're seeing to devastating effect during this pandemic, uh, where the one of two drugs that has shown any therapeutic value, remdesivir, uh, is as a patent held by Gilead, even though we paid for the development of this drug. It's the only thing that's showing real uh, ability to do anything. 
and there's shortages of it across the country. Doctors can't get this drug. And if you think that it's bad now and doctors will tell you it is bad, they can't get the drugs that they need, wait until there's a vaccine or a treatment that actually is very effective, then you'll see the true effect of these shortages of these decades long dismantling of our ability to produce drugs here. Uh, and all of it is to benefit one thing, the corporate bottom line of these pharmaceutical corporations. And they're merciless and relentless at it. That's why I said I had the easiest job because it's never changed. In every single trade deal going back, uh, Lori, can check my work on this because she's fought against all of these bad trade deals. Uh, pharma has always had their finger in it and they write the section. We're not, as the people allowed to see it, it's illegal, it's a, it's a secret negotiation, it's so good for us. They write it to extend that monopoly, to allow them to charge those highest prices for longer periods and to lock other countries that have systems that allow them to negotiate prices uh, that, that don't allow the pharmaceutical corporations to create shortages to drive up prices. The trade deals are aimed at breaking those down. And so what we've seen for decades is actually that global public health activists have been some of the fiercest opponents of uh, trade deals going so far as to leaking uh, the, the trade, the details of the trade deals sometimes under severe threat uh, from their own governments around the world. Uh, but they know that what it means is life and death. Because in some countries, if the trade deal goes through, it means they're no longer going to have access to antiretrovirals for HIV. It means that they're not going to have uh, the ability for a national health system to afford the drugs that their, their citizens need. That's what U.S. trade policy has been being used for. That's not trade policy, that's corporate predation. And, and I want trade policies. I, I, it, we should talk about trade policies, but that's not what has been happening. That's why we need to go a different direction. Uh, and then I wanna really quickly say, Trans-Pacific Partnership, TPP. I want everyone to understand how pharma operates. We beat the pharma positions out of that. It was a big victory. It was like, everyone was like, I can't believe we did this. Um, we, we first time and it was huge and everyone, we needed everyone's participation in it. Uh, and it was, and we were super proud to have played a small role in it. And the solidarity from labor and environment and our champions on the Hill, it was really amazing. What pharma did is they just took that piece, put it on a shelf, waited for Donald Trump to revise NAFTA. Uh, and there were good pieces in revised NAFTA, but they just gave him the pharma piece and he just put it in, just whole, the whole section. It's, they lost, but they know that all they have to do is get us playing the same game and they're gonna win at some point. Now, we were able to again beat these pharma provisions out of new NAFTA, but it, it was definitely not Donald Trump. It was only because of the Democrats, uh, the unity of the Democrats to say, we will not sign this thing if you allow uh, pharma to use it to raise people's drug prices. Um, we got that out, but it's still sitting on pharma's shelf. That's what I want everyone to know. As long as we're playing this rigged game, we will always inevitably lose at some point because they are relentless. They will come back time and time again. But the hope is that out of this just incredibly predicted pandemic, we know uh, the risks of pandemic and we know that there will be future pandemics. But I think people now see really clearly how dangerous it is to not have our own ability to create the drugs that we need, especially the drugs that we have paid for. Uh, and in fact, leaving that to these corporations means that we don't get the drugs that we need and neither does anyone around the world. And the only winners in this system are very few incredibly rich people uh, who are just stealing our money, our health, and in some cases, our lives 
uh, for profit. So uh, thank you everyone on the panel and to everyone watching. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Alex. And we have no Q&A right now. We have no questions. So I'm going to call out again for questions and answers and want for questions so we can answer. And while we're waiting for that, let me just sum up in a way what we've heard here from two amazing members of Congress and two amazing civil society champions. We have a current trade system that was not an act of God. It was rigged by corporations who behind closed doors could create the rules. The current rules handcuff governments from doing the right things. They set a ceiling on progressive policies but there is no floor. It's not connected to the existing international standards like the human rights trees of the UN, the ILO, et cetera. So we need to replace the trade agreements. We also separately, and we didn't get into this, have specific issues relating to China trade that have to do with issues like Congressman Dingle mentioned relating to currency, subsidies, real trade issues as compared to the corporate rigging through trade agreements of free trade agreements having monopolies as Arthur, as Arthur, as Alex said, which you know would probably have David Ricardo and 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 Adam Smith rolling in their graves. So we have to get rid of the bad. We have to put in place new agreements that put human standards in place for climate, for the environment, for human rights, for labor rights. And then, as Brenda said, and 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 Roe and Debbie both said, and Alex, we then need the right domestic policies. We need to get rid of the outsourcing incentives in our tax policy and instead incentivize investing and creating jobs in the US. We need to break up the existing monopolies. If we want production capacity, we both have to get rid of outsourcing incentives. But in addition, we need to break up what is now a pattern, including in pharma voraciously, of the big companies eating up the smaller ones and for efficiency, i.e. blocking competition, to shut down the competitors and we don't have capacity. We need industrial policy that actually, as Rose said, invests in training workers, that invests in the startup money and the funding to actually incentivize, as Congresswoman Dingle said, the actual investment in reestablishing supply chain in critical sectors. The next disaster may not be health. It could be a cyber attack on, on the electric grid. It could be any number of other things where we'll find ourselves equally flat-footed without rebuilding our manufacturing sector. And we need specific rules that disincentivize outsourcing including the mass call center race to the bottom outsourcing, such as the bill that CWA is pushing in the House and Senate right now, which requires these companies to give notice if they're going to do an outsourcing move, and then they lose their ability to get government contracts. That's part of industrial policy. The government in the U.S. has an enormous budget of procurement. If that money is cut off from companies that outsource auto jobs or that outsource call centers, there are a whole bunch of companies that would think twice as compared to now the incentives are do what you want. You get a tax cut and you still get your government contract. So that is a summary of the entire panel of the what we could do very clearly differently as progressives to actually make a difference for, for social justice, for economic justice, for climate justice. And our goose is cooked if we don't make these changes policy wise. But politically, it's also the path for the Democratic Party to be the party that represents people. So I'm still seeing ah, a question popped up, hallelujah. So do you think a tax on outsourcing is the best way to combat shipping jobs overseas? And I am gonna read one other. Can, can or would the World Bank or IMF bring any pressure to improve trade policies? And if so, how? Those are two, um, two questions. Uh, here's one more. How do we create a globalist trade policy that protects American workers while not relying on xenoph xenophobic sentiments towards workers overseas? That one popped up too. So I am going to just do an open round. Anyone in the panel who wants to speak, open your mic and please have at it. We have five more minutes for this, for this round, actually 10. Who'd like to have a first go? Well, I, I mean, I, I'll go first because nobody else is jumping up. I mean, what I think is we need tax policies that support people investing in manufacturing in this country. And then we need to re renegotiate a lot of our trade deals and quite frankly, stop making bad trade deals that in, in, incentivize the overseas production 
we need a level playing field. And I think that that's what people do not realize that what's happened. Our, I, you know, some people think I was going to say this earlier and I didn't, so now I'm going to say it now. People think, I'm tired of people saying industrial policy is socialist policy or common. Industrial policy is when the business and government work together for the betterment of the people in your communities and to help workers. And while this country may think of it as a foreign, uh, you know, we shouldn't do it. Other countries, what do you think Japan is doing? What do you think China's doing? Ger Germany, all these other countries work together so that the people in their country, they're helping to protect workers. So Roe is dead right when he talks about how we need to have an industrial policy that works. And having business, governor, government, and labor work together is a good thing for the residents and the citizens of this country. And it's really important for the workers. And I think it's what we need to be focused on. Thank you, Completely, Congresswoman. Uh... I love Debbie's passion. I, I, I mm -hmm. completely agree with uh, uh, what she said. I, I would note that we have a tax code right now uh, that is favored towards outsourcing and it was a deliberate effort. I mean, when a company goes overseas, uh, they don't have to pay the same corporate tax that they do when they produce uh, something here. And Trump actually, in the Republican tax cut said, now you can even bring it back. You can go overseas, make your money, bring it back. Uh, and basically not pay uh, any tax in a repatriation uh, holiday. And so what would you do if you're a company, you say, okay, do I hire people in America or do I go overseas and avoid this, this corporate tax? Now, initially we thought we wanted our multinationals to have footprints around the world and be competitive. And there may have been uh, an initial policy incentive to do, but what that has resulted in is the massive offshoring of jobs. So we should reverse that. We should now say that the tax should be level. And if you're uh, going to put something offshore, uh, you should pay the same tax as if you're gonna uh, have uh, Americans uh, working. The second thing is we've had a policy that's totally favored labor, I mean, capital over labor. I mean, we don't, we give tax credits for depreciation. We don't give tax credits for hiring workers or investing in workers. So uh, I think as Lori pointed out, these are deliberate decisions that we made uh, to benefit American consumers, to benefit American shareholders. Uh, and it's, it's not to say that, it, that there was no rationale behind it, but the balance was totally off. We were so focused on cheaper consumer goods and maximizing shareholder profits that we totally forgot about the impact it was gonna have on workers and communities. And what people like Debbie have been saying is no, you know, uh, the dignity of communities matter, workers matter, that has to, they have to be stakeholders in our policy. As well as just reliability of supply and, and national yeah. security. I mean, everyone who isn't progressive, who's not worried about the things Congressman Khan is mentioning, which certainly pull at my heart, are also thinking, holy beans, we're really in trouble. I don't have to worry about working people. I just can't get a mask. And that is an opportunity for all of us. And I don't know, Brenda or Alex, if you have more to add. Yeah, I was just going to say that, you know, the decline in union membership has created a divide between those that have and those that have not. So it's bad enough that we've seen a decline in union membership in the United States, but now they're taking our work and they're moving it overseas. So our folks are feeling like they are um, being screwed by workers overseas. And the overseas workers who are only making $2 an hour don't understand why the U.S. is feeling that way. But just recently in the Philippines, they were taking some of the work that they were doing because they found a lower cost provider to do it. And that's why CWA is supporting uh, legislation at the federal and at the state level to uh, incentivize companies to keep work in America and not ship it overseas. The balance is out of whack and we need to bring it back. And I think with our new president and our uh, majority in the Senate and our continued majority in the House, we're going to be able to make this happen. Um, if, I, if I can, I'd, I'll also just add in the fourth question, how do we combat big pharma when they are so entrenched, um, in, in, into my answer, uh, which is that we just have to fight them uh, here 
there and everywhere they are. Uh, and we have to, in that fight, really just let people be as angry as they are, harness it and wield it against the, where the problem is, which is uh, policymakers being captured and corrupted by pharma money. Uh, because hatred of pharma and high drug prices is definitely not a partisan issue. It doesn't matter if it's a camo wearing uh, NRA hat wearer or somebody who drives a Prius, they all hate pharma and they all hate <laughs> high drug prices. Um, so the goal is we have to capture that and point it here and break pharma's stranglehold with money that they have in Washington, D.C. And again, it's extremely grim that it's come down to uh, what to the pandemic exposing just how bad uh, the, the systems are there for, for, for the people. But also the pandemic has exposed it to everybody. The curtain is pulled back. Everybody sees who's at the wheels. Uh, and it is these corporate, uh, these corporations and Wall Street bankers who do not care for the people. Uh, so we have an opportunity to fundamentally reshape how we do things going forward both domestically with laws that break the monopolies that pharma has, that get a public return on the public investment, we put the money in, but then also in redefining what trade deals are. They're never going to be moving forward a place where we export our broken rules into other countries. They're never going to be a place where corporate lobbyists should have the pen. Corporate lobbyists shouldn't be in the room at all. We want workers in the room. We want public health experts in the room. We want science experts in the room, manufacturing experts in the room. That's the new vision that we all have to come together on. And I do think we have an opportunity because COVID-19 has laid it all bare. Alex is spot on, as is our other panelists. I'll very quickly answer in one sentence the other questions. No, the IMF and World Bank is not going to help. In fact, they were imposing these boneheaded policies, this package of neoliberalities on developing countries before the same corporations decide to use trade agreements to do it to the developed countries. So they are, they are not with the program. And as far as how to have a globalist trade policy without xenophobia, we basically need to rewrite the rules so that we set the internationally agreed standards of the International Labor Organization, the UN's human rights treaties, the multilateral environmental agreements, the different World Health Organization, health and access to medicine treaties, et cetera, as the floor so that we're not having a race to the bottom. We're having a race like we have with interstate commerce to a place that is the international rule, just so we have a national rule. States can go higher in the US, they can't go below. Countries, if we had this floor of decency, could go higher, but they can't go below. Right now, there's no floor. And as well, part of the answer is what Brenda talked about, which is cross-border union organizing, so that the multinational companies have a universal contract that represents the workers wherever the work goes, so that the incentive isn't to take it to the place of the lowest common denominator. So with that, I would like to thank all of our panelists, all of our participants, and I do think Alex is spot on with his optimistic sound because heaven forbid we have all of this pain and suffering of 25 years of race to the bottom, NAFTA, WTO globalization that's devastated communities, a learned experience there peaked off by the COVID experience, which brought home to everyone who wasn't directly impacted by that or the call center outsourcing, destroying communities. You didn't have to live with the outsourcing to realize we are totally screwed with the way we have currently set up the rules of the global economy because everyone's living with it because of COVID. So it's an incredible, powerful opportunity where even team status quo is realizing they may have gone too far. We need to seize that moment as progressives and really turn around these corporate rigged trade agreement rules. And if there's any doubt we can do it, think of Alex's story about the people beating pharma, one of the most powerful entities in the world, twice out of TPP and then forcing the renegotiation of the new NAFTA, thanks to great Democratic champions like Congresswoman Dingell and Congressman Khanna and their colleagues who basically made it politically impossible to do the bad kind of trade agreement. And with our international civil society allies, we've stopped WTO expansion into all kinds of bad rules. So there is lots of evidence of winning 
when people power is organized, people are educated, and we aim at our governments united with our partners in other countries to fight for the right rules. So that is why progressives must seize back the trade agenda from Trump for politics, for policy, and we can do it and we can win. And I look forward to working with all of our panelists and all of you in doing that. And again, a round of thanks again to our wonderful panelists, two of our greatest progressive pro-worker, pro-environment, congressional champions, to great civil society leaders, and to all of you who joined us today. Onward, we're going to win this trade replacement working together with our brothers and sisters overseas. Thank you, everyone, and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.